Coming up next on Arizona Horizons, State Superintendent of Public Instruction John Hoopenthal will join us to discuss his controversial web postings and find out what the Export-Import Bank is and why businesses are worried about its possible demise. Those stories next on Arizona Horizons. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. It was one year ago today that tragedy struck Arizona. 19 firefighters from the Granite Mountain Hotshot crew lost their lives in the Yarnell Hill fire. ASU Regents Professor Stephen Pine, who has written numerous books on wildfires and wildland management, talks about the severity of the Yarnell Hill fire. There are different measures of severity, and for most, most people, the severity will be measured in lives lost or property lost, and this is pretty close to the top, um, followed probably by uh, the Dude Creek Fire in 1990. We've had large fires, but they haven't necessarily uh, caused fatalities or lots of property damage. The fire didn't introduce anything new to fire behavior that the fire community hasn't known for a long time. Um, Steep terrain, uh, dense brush, drought, maximum temperatures, uh, winds, and then uh, thunderstorm downdrafts, dry, dry uh, downdrafts on top of that. Boy, this is all textbook fire behavior. And all those, all those compass points were all aligned in the same direction towards maximum uh, fire intensity. This afternoon, a memorial ceremony was held in Prescott to remember the fallen firefighters. A bell in Courthouse Square rang 19 times in honor of those who lost their lives. Arizona Superintendent of Public Instruction John Hoopenthal is under fire for posting controversial and anonymous online statements that many Arizonans found offensive. John Hoopenthal joins us now on Arizona Horizon, and we thank you for joining us. Um, Ted, can't, it's always great to be with you. Well, it can't be easy, but we're going to try and figure out what's going on here. And the first question is why? Why did you feel the need to make the online postings that you made? Um, Ted, I shouldn't have. It was a mistake, <clears throat> and uh, I, I let my family down. I let my team at the Department of Education down. And most of all, I let the citizens of Arizona down. So it was a mistake. I shouldn't have done it, <clears throat> and I've apologized for it. But the important thing is we've got a job to do and we're working on that job. My team is working on that job, often in a spectacular fashion. Let me give you one example. We have a program in Arizona, English for All Students. It's structured English immersion. We reclassify, we move over 90% of our students into our regular classes with skills in reading, uh, speaking, and writing English. It is one of the more spectacular education success stories across the nation. You have this education success story, mm -hmm. and yet no one wants to hear about it. They want to know why. They want some answers from you. They want you to explain yourself as to why you made the postings and why you did it anonymously. Well, Ted, it was a mistake. I shouldn't have done it, um, and I apologized for it. I, you know, I let my, my family down. The, the, these writings didn't reflect um, most of all my actions as superintendent. Let me give you another example. We have a program called Move On When Reading. Uh, <clears throat> requires that students have basic reading skills by the end of third grade. Three years ago, we had 4,400 students that failed that classification. It is another one of these spectacular success stories. We moved that down to 2,200 students that are, on, that are at risk now. It's a huge success story. It's been a partnership that we've had with Governor Brewer, um, with the State Board of Education, and uh, we've done a phenomenal job partnering with the school districts. Some of the school districts, over 90% 90 per, 90 of their students, they've rescued them as a result of this program. I think some of those school districts, some of those educators, some of the students, some of the parents, some of the teachers, uh -huh. um, they still want to know why. I understand that you've now said it's a mistake uh, and you have apologized for this, but people, uh, people want to know why. What, was, what made you sit there in front of your computer and, and, res and engage in these kinds of debates and do it anonymously. Um, Ted, I have a passion for public policy. It, it drives me in everything that, I've, that I do. Um, and it's a passion to serve the community and to do it with a great deal of knowledge. The, my blog comments, they were offensive, they were hurtful. I've repudiated them. The, um, the, um, when I go home at night, I study every single night. 
I go and I read. I have over 600 books on my Kindles. Um, I have four Kindles. I fluctuate between all those. We have, expect leaders to have a profound knowledge. My blog comments didn't, the, the blog comments that people have read don't reflect that profound knowledge. And I seek that. I owe it, you know, I, I feel deeply apologetic for, the, for those blog comments, but they absolutely were a mistake. Let's go back to what we've done. These things that we've done as a department have been phenomenal. Just last week, I met with a superintendent of a small school district, and he was telling me he was just euphoric. The previous year, it had taken him 40 days to do a report, and with our, the work we've done at reducing administrative costs, he, it only took him four and a half hours. We're now $300 per student below the national average in administrative costs. That's $330 million that have been freed up in reduced administrative costs. We've been a part of driving that at the part department, just stripping out all the bureaucracy and paperwork. Um, you mentioned that you were apologetic for these, these postings and these statements, and yet your original response did not sound apologetic. And a former uh, superintendent of public instruction, Lisa Graham Keegan, says when she first contacted you, you were not apologetic and you stood by what you said and the actions of saying them. What changed? Well, I don't want to characterize my conversation with somebody else. Um, I absolutely, um, these, the, my blog comments were a mistake. I repudiated them. They were hurtful to my family. They were especially hurtful to my team at the Department of Education. But we have a job to do, and we are moving forward with that job. Let me give you another example. We, through our nutrition department, we have partnered with the spiritual leaders in, in na neighborhoods that are high in poverty to be able to deliver summer food programs. The spiritual leaders I've talked to are ecstatic about that program. It's a huge breakthrough. They never felt like they were a part of that whole process in the past, and, we, and with them being able to be part of the delivery. These are the actions that I've taken as superintendent. The Move On One Reading Program, the partnership with Governor Brewer there, um, the, um, the, 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 a whole variety of these, the nutrition program, and, and, and again, English how, for All Students. How do you think those people feel when they read you describing people on assistance as lazy pigs getting air conditioning, free health care, flat screen, screen TVs, which you said are typical of poor people. How do you think they feel? The, that blog comment was offensive. It was hurtful. I've repudiated it. I've um, uh, apologized for it. But why, what, what the, made you say it in the first place? People want to know. They understand well, that you're apologetic, but what made you say it in the first place? Well, I have a deep passion um, for Coming from my, a disadvantaged background myself, I have a deep passion for moving people off of, out of poverty and off of welfare. When you look at the data on, on welfare, it is, it is shocking. A, a child who grows up in a, in, a, in a welfare environment, by the age of three, they've heard 30 million fewer words than their comparable compatriots. That deep passion I have for do, acting and which I've acted continuously to try and provide opportunity every way we can in Arizona. And, and yet, you just made an argument for what you believe. I didn't hear lazy pigs in that statement. What made you think you could say, what, what made you think you could say these things about these people anonymously and no one would ever find out? Those comments <clears throat> don't reflect the, the way I think. They don't reflect what's in my heart. And they especially don't reflect the actions that I've taken as superintendent. You mentioned, um, oh, please, uh, go, I mean, we, go ahead. we work and we work hard at our agency. And, you know, w when we talked about the people that were in there, it's common for me to leave the department at 7 or 8 o'clock at night and to walk by office after office. There are people still there working on the mission. So especially I let them down. And, uh, but, you know, the work goes on. We're doing amazing things in that agency. Did, did, um, you, did you post any of these online comments from your office? There were a couple, evidently, that were posted from the office. Um, Appropriate to do that, do you think? You know, I'm a superintendent of public instruction, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the comments that I posted typically were highly factual comments, things like saying, letting people know that <clears throat> over the last several years, automobile thefts have gone from 48,000 down to 18,000. So the question is, as we look, as we ponder data like that, and we discuss it in various forums, mm -hmm. why? Why is, there, why is this huge reduction 
in automobile thefts. You think it's because of Russell Pierce's immigration ideas? The, um, um, my hypothesis is I'm very interested in what role education played in that reduction in auto thefts. Who, who steals cars? Um, it's young people who steal cars, either people who are still in school or it's people who, uh, who are just out of school. I regard it, that is something that's enormously fascinating. It's fa what is the step, what is right. the, what, why have we experienced an unbelievable 32,000 uh, reduction in automobile thefts? It sounds these like. These are the kinds of discussions that, right. these are the things that are typical of the way I think and how I discuss them. But it sounds like you already had it figured out when you said we have a lot fewer Caucasians working now that the Hispanics have left, but crime is much lower, no money, and no one is stealing it. What do you mean by that? The, um, th that, those, my blog comments were offensive. Those comments, um, I apologize for those. They were deeply hurtful. The thing that I have always had a concern about was when we are dealing with um, all of these issues that we, be, that we be very knowledgeable. And so in this particular case, we have my fellow conservatives have made the case that there is a reduction in, in employment that's associated with immigration. And what I was pointing out there is look at Texas. Texas took a different path than Arizona and they have taken a different employment path for, for native Texans as, and we, we see the same thing in Arizona. So you're not completely repudiating that statement? The, the, that statement there was offensive in how it was worded and it was hurtful. I am repudiating that statement and I'm apologizing for it. Another one is we're condemning ourselves to a second rate future if we don't reestablish the melting pot with a strong flow of immigrants engaging in economic activity and not crime, the assumption there being that the immigrants were engaging in crime. We all need to stamp out, uh, stomp out balkanization. No Spanish radio stations, no Spanish billboards, no Spanish TV stations, no Spanish newspapers. This is America. Speak English. The, what did you mean by that? Well, well, that comment was offensive. It was hurtful. And frankly, Ted, it's ridiculous. <laughs> they, um, um, I, just, I just have a deep passion for understanding particularly growing up on the south side of Tucson, that English is the language of opportunity and that we have a, we have a moral obligation to pass this on to all of the students, the English language learners. We, I am so proud of the fact that we are moving 90% of these students into our regular classrooms with skills in reading, writing, and speaking. These, um, that's, the, that's the things, those are the things that I have passion for. Did the fact those that you were, comments, got, I, 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 we got I you, reject yeah. those. D did the fact that you were posting anonymously, did that make you say things that you wouldn't ordinarily say? Would you stand in front of a group of educators and say MAS, Mexican American Studies, equals KKK? The, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, there were a number of those blog comments, um, um, they were offensive, they were hurtful, I've apologized for them, but again, actions are what counts in the end in what we do in society. What we have done is we have worked ourselves to the point of exhaustion and successfully to make opportunity for students in, for, who come from poverty homes, poverty neighborhoods, students of challenge, and we have a whole string of accomplishments and we can talk about how we have taken a posture of being servants to these homes and to these families. And yet, why should a Latino kid from a poor family uh, trust you as education chief? Why should a Latino educator, Latino families, especially those from low income areas, why should they trust you regardless of what you've done or what you want to do when they know, they think they know, and most folks would assume that this is somewhere in your heart when they read this stuff, why should educators in general trust you? Well, Ted, that, those comments are nowhere in my heart. And let me, you know, in terms of the trust issue, um, this last week I went down to Tucson, went down to high minority, high poverty um, um, school where I have a math project going. And I thought, wow, this might be a little prickly. And I walked in there and there were a lot of teachers there and they came over to me and they asked me about it and I apologized for it. And we had an incredible day as these students did over 500 math problems each. The bottom line, they should trust me because we are getting things done for them. We are moving programs forward to support them. We are moving these students up academically. Our academic results have been moving steadily. 
We're allowing them to achieve rating skills. We're opening up the doors of economic opportunity. For and them. yet they see you when, they th when you thought you were anonymous, when no one was going to find out who was saying this, saying this kind of stuff. I mean, again, it, it sounds like, all right, are you, going to, are you going to resign or are you going to stay in office? Ted, absolutely, I am staying in office. Um, there's, we have a job to do, and we are doing that job every single day. And we are accomplishing it often in a spectacular fashion. Are you going to I continue? Talked about are, 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 when, I are, talked about Move On, yes, move you on have. When Reading. I talked about yes, our, have. our nutrition programs across the board. When you go out and you talk to people out in the community, I mean, I had a, the conversation with that superintendent who talked about the mm -hmm. massive reduction in paperwork. That's freeing up $300 million available for the classroom. We're going to free up another $100 million just with reduction in paperwork. Are you going to run for re-election, continue the running for re-election? Absolutely, Ted. I'm, I'm continuing to run for re-election. Uh, have you been treated fairly in all this? The, Ted, when you overstep your bounds like this, you have no right to be treated fairly. Um, I made a serious mistake. Um, I shouldn't have done it. I apologize for it. Um, I'll let others, people, other people speak to that issue as to whether I've been treated fairly. What do you think? The, um, you know, Ted, I've been in this business for 30 years. I've taken a lot of criticism over time. I view it as part of the, as part of the territory. What's given me great pleasure over time is the work that I do, being able to reduce the cost of government so we reduce taxes, but also make government more effective so we get the great things government do, done, we can still get those done. What have you learned from all this? The um, lessons learned is that you're, you're on the front page with every single comment you make. And you know, you have an obligation in this office to uphold a certain standard of honor for, for students, for teachers, and for parents. And when you fall short on that, you're going to be held accountable in some pretty serious and severe ways. And again, you think you're being held accountable in a fair fashion. You know, I'll let other people speak to that. I, I accept the, the criticism. I've thought deeply about it. Have, a, have had a lot of discussions. You know, my daughter called me up in tears, um, talking to me about it. It's been I've, I've done. You know, it's been pretty hurtful. The you know people who are working 12, 13-hour days for you, believing in the mission. You you know when you let those down. But now we're continuing on with the okay. job. We we have a lot of people that we're serving. And we're, we're doing great work, and we're going to keep doing that great work. Superintendent Hubenthal, we thank you so much for joining us tonight on Arizona Thank Horizon. you, Ted. The Export-Import Bank of the United States is designed to boost U.S. business interests overseas, but the bank's charter expires at the end of September, and business groups are concerned that Congress will refuse to reauthorize the agency. Dennis Hoffman is director of the Seidman Research Institute at ASU's W.P. Carey School of Business. He's here to talk about what the bank does and its impact on the economy. What does this bank do? Well, first, Ted, this, this is great. This is the, you know, the fight du jour uh, it's, at least it's not the debt ceiling this time. I think this is an important issue to some businesses, uh, but uh, whether or not this bank stays or goes is a far different issue than some of the recent debates we've had. Um, you, you know, on the, on the side of, uh, of getting rid of this bank, well, let me back up here. The, the, the bank really is designed to provide credit for these export-based transactions that take place. You know, you know, trade depends upon credit. 
Now, 98% of this credit comes from the private sector. Only 2% comes from, you know, from this bank. Uh, but, but yet it remains controversial, those folks that want to get rid of it, and they range from Ralph Nader to the Tea Party, by the way. Now, there's a strange union, but uh, they want to get rid of this uh, because they don't support big businesses. They see that this bank supports uh, two primary businesses in the U.S., and that's Caterpillar and Boeing, although there's a vast array of smaller businesses that also are supported. Is it does um, it, correct me if I'm wrong here, but looking into this, it sounds like it subsidizes already subsidized foreign government buyers. Is that is that remotely well, in the possible? Ballpark? Possible, you could think of it that way, and so the, therefore it's redundant. Um, you know, we get rid of a little bit of G. That means a little less government and taxes can go down. Yada yada yada. The challenge with that particular argument, and that is what's advanced by those that want to get rid of it, is. Um, this is a competitive environment, and you will be ceding some jobs to foreign governments that don't get rid of their export financing subsidies, and that would be places like Japan, Korea, um, it, you know, to, to some degree Europe does this, although Europe and the U.S. have this mutual agreement around airlines uh, in terms of their domestic markets. But, but nonetheless, it's there will be some job loss uh, here in the U.S. Uh, if Boeing and Caterpillar don't get these uh, uh, this break. Have we seen job losses just because of the debate regarding reauthorization? Well, probably not. I I don't think, you know, I don't think it's reached that level. And I and I think that markets will find a way. So if if Caterpillar and Boeing lose this subsidy, they're going to have to take it out of their. Um, employees, they're going to have to take it out of their returns to their shareholders, or they're going to have to find some alternative means of financing. I've heard it called cronyism, all right. and, I, and I've also heard it to say cronyism and really not all that effective. Valid? Well, you know, the, the incentives are everywhere, and, and people have to understand this. You know, I'm told that Texas has the best tax structure, and that's why all businesses move to Texas. Well, they also have the biggest incentive fund. It's $20 billion. It's Texas's incentive fund annually is almost as big as the entire U.S. Export-Import Bank. Uh, so, the, you know, these are, the, these are big deals. Incentives uh, are at play. And we'd like to say in a perfect world we could get rid of crony capitalism. Uh, but it's a tougher game to play if you're the first one to get rid of it. Well, with that in mind, we talked about what the critics say supporters, including President mm -hmm. Obama, who wants to extend that charter, I think, five years, and he wants to increase the amount that the bank can lend. What would be the impact of that? Well, if it's uh, used strategically to promote exports in this country, and by the way, we've not done that aggressively like other countries have, uh, it could be job uh, growing, it could be economy enhancing, but uh, you do have to figure out optimal ways of doing it. I'm hearing, you know, arguments around picking certain industries. Well, we want to only support small businesses. Well, we only want to support those businesses that are friendly to the environment. You know, now you've got even a second level of government intervention here. Uh, you know, to me, a job is a job, if it's a job at a big business or if it's a job at a small business. Um, you know, Boeing obviously is very important in this state, although not the, a division that relies that much on the Export-Import Bank. Uh, but, but big businesses are important to the labor market. Can so, you picture Tucson without Raytheon, right, for example? Right. I mean, it, the big businesses are very important. So we, we've got one side saying you know, kill it, the other side saying extend it and give it more money to, to work with. Right. Are there reforms somewhere in the middle that could make at sure, least most folks happy. Sure, there'd be compromises. I think that you'd want to, you know, you'd look at this and make sure that there's not, uh, you know, uh, a dirty dealing here somewhere, or uh, you know, people are getting undue benefits. That there is in, is definitely a need. I think you can get into the data with Caterpillar, for example. If Caterpillar doesn't get this incentive on selling goods to China, will Korea and Japan actually be able to? compete with, have a competitive advantage against them? It seems to me that's an empirical question. We could investigate it and 
come to a conclusion. And again, September 30th is that date for the, uh, do you think it's going to think it's going to be extended? I don't know at this point. You know, I, I think the Tea Party may be looking for a victory, and uh, th this could be uh, a, a place where they uh, choose to go. Dennis, good to have you. Thanks for joining Great us. Great to be here, Ted. Tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, join us for another clean elections debate, this time between Republican candidates running for Secretary of State. A debate Tuesday evening, 5.30 and 10, right here on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.